Hi, my name is Annie Grossman, and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. So I am here with Zell Crampton, uh, founder of Diggs. Is that is that how you call the company, or is it Diggs Pet Products, or just Diggs? Just Diggs. <laughs> and um, I wanted to talk to Zell today because he has a product that is innovative in a, in a bunch of ways, which we, we will talk about. But I think interesting to me in part because it's really like the only innovative thing <laughs> in in the world and the world is crates um at school for the dogs we have um maybe a dozen crates they're really important we use them every day all the time and uh nobody likes them i would say these crates have no fans but they're they're clunky they hurt your fingers when you have to close them and open them all the time which we we do every day all day um, they're noisy, they fall over, they, they're ugly, um, but they're totally necessary. Like, we couldn't live without them, and yet I don't think anybody who works at School for the Dogs would have any nice thing to say about any of them. And uh, what you're doing in the world of crates is, uh, it gives me hope that, <laughs> that there, there is a future that could be better uh, for this product. Um, but um, I know Diggs has two products, and, and why don't you, you tell us um, about, about those two products, and then we can talk about how you, how you got into this world. Sure. Uh, so our, our flagship product is the, the Diggs Revel Dog Crate. Um, as you just rightfully said, crates are ugly, hard to use, unsafe, noisy, hard to collapse, hard to transport. Frankly, they're they're a they're an abysmal product when you consider other consumer categories. Like they just haven't been changed in fifty years. They're just the same old ugly wire thing that for some reason never got never innovated. And, Why? Uh, you know, I'll give you my opinion. I don't know for a fact, but I I actually think that the history of the pet industry is really that you know pets used to be property, right? And they're legally speaking, they are still property. But people used to view the pets as their property, right? I'm a dog owner, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so what that meant, or a master, a master, that's right. What, that's what my dad used to call, right. call himself master. growing up. He was the, our dog's master, right? which and seems so like dated to me. Now. Of course. I mean, you can, you think of like, in some ways the dog t- today is your master, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who picks up whose poop, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, I think Seinfeld had a funny joke once saying like, if aliens came down from space and like looked at this and they'd assume the dogs are in charge. <laughs> 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 but my point is that when dogs truly were property, not just from a legal standpoint, but also from uh, uh, how we viewed them, it was all about cheap, low quality, right? So you had companies who said, okay, let's make this as cheaply as possible. Who can get it the cheapest from China? Who can like make the, the lowest quality product that's just, just going to like meet the bar of what's required? Mm-hmm. And that, you know, most pet products are made that way. Mm-hmm. And then you can argue if it's the last five years, 10 years, 15 years, but re- in recent history... Pets have totally changed the way, like, we, have, we, we see pets totally differently. And it's not just a U.S. phenomenon, by the way. It's almost a global phenomenon uh, where pets are now treated, if not as well in some ways, equal or better to than our children. Mm-hmm. And so what, what comes with that is a much higher expectation of what a product can and should be, specific, particularly for something we care about so much. Uh, but now you're asking all these old school companies who've been making the same crummy products for like a long time to innovate and try something totally different They're And they're just not built for that. Right. Uh, and so it takes someone to kind of like say, okay, we're going to try this differently, you know, and you know, it, 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 it's a complicated product because it's a safety product first and foremost, and it's expensive to make and it requires a global supply chain and, you know, you know, so on and so forth. So I think it's just, it's now the time when, people are looking for that product enough that it's worthwhile to invest and take those risks. So of the two products that you are making right now, there's the crate and the bed. Mm-hmm. So tell me what makes these two products different. Sure. Um, so the crate is solves the key pain points we're just talking about. So it's much better looking. We actually took a lot of cues from premium baby products. Mm. So things like rounded edges, 
uh, high quality aluminum and, and reinforced plastics. Uh, it just gives a, an air of like what you would associate with your your, your real child, your baby, uh, and like you bought, you see these fancy strollers, like you know we, we're in New York City right now, kind of going oh, yeah. all, all over the place. So we actually partnered with a baby products manufacturer who can recreate some of those aesthetics and quality. Wow, interesting. Yeah, so we're the only we're the only pet company who's making products at a baby factory. So it's literally the same products that you trust, like to put your baby in a car seat. That's where our crates are made. Hmm. Okay. Um, and which brings me to my second point around safety. So crates, as you alluded to, have all kinds of safety issues, right? From, you know, just the simple stuff like pinching your fingers and, you know, ta- oh, paws God. getting pinched. Tell me about it, yeah. <laughs> but there are real safety concerns, things like um, because they're not structural, they're so flimsy, there have been some horrible stories where you have the dog in the crate and kids playing around at home. Kids jump on top of the crate, you know. Mm. Uh, so we were worked, worked with the, you know, we were we got advice from the Center for Pet Safety on, on kind of all those issues that we need to solve. Um and so, for example, our crate is much more structural, right? It can, it can hold the weight of an adult sitting on top of it, right? Hmm. So we've solved that problem. Or um, paws and jaws tend to get caught, uh, can get caught, I mean to say, in the, those typical vertical holes and bars because very anxious dogs might try and force their paw through or their jaw, and they've been known to you know, break a nail or break a tooth or get their paw stuck. Uh, we, so we changed the shape of the openings so that paws and jaws can go freely in and out without getting caught. And so we've done like extensive testing to make sure with, with like fake paws that paws won't get stuck. Mm-hmm. Um, the third thing is uh, ergonomics, right? Uh, we talked about like your know, fingers getting caught, but just trying to open the crate, those fiddly latches are kind of a pain for us to use, but dogs have even learned how to open them, mm-hmm. right? So we said, okay, let's make this one-handed and impossible for a dog to open. Or uh, let's make, you know your life easier with things like when you're crate training and you got to calm your dog in the process of crate training or f- treat or feed them, you have to open the door and they want to squirm right out. So let's make it the, the ceiling open so that you can com- you can pet them and put a treat inside and they can't squirm out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all, we've thought about all the kind of different use cases from puppy to adulthood and how it's used differently and, and you know tried to make things much simpler and easier for you to use. So we have all kinds of features for those kinds of things. And the last but not least is what we call just uh, collapsibility and transportability. Uh, if you've ever tried to collapse and move a, a wire crate around, it's all you know. It takes two people and six arms, it's, mm-hmm. and you know that's lucky if you can not pinch yourself doing it. So we, we had this revolutionary thing where all you do is turn a handle in the ceiling, and it just collapses into itself and can either roll away or be carried like a suitcase. It's also nice that uh, it looks nice. Mm-hmm. It's not like an awful thing. <laughs> I I uh, there used to be a crate. It's called the EO crate or the IO crate. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't. It it was it looked like a dome. Oh, and, right. I've seen uh, that style. Yeah, and it was the only nice-looking crate I think that I'd ever seen, but I think it was like $1,200 or something like that. I'm not sure if they still make it. Um, but I've had clients who've said, well, I don't want to use a crate because I, I don't like how they look and I don't want that in my apartment, mm-hmm. um, which is... I don't know. It's a hard thing to argue with because, yeah, they are ugly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, you know, they're they're often very necessary. Um, and uh, I, the other thing I like about your crate is that it's open because, mm-hmm. you know, there I guess there's sort of three styles of crates that I see most often. It's the open wire ones, which is what we use at School for the Dogs and what I generally recommend because my feeling about crates is that a dog should feel like they're still part of their environment. I don't want the dog to feel like they're secluded in a completely separate area. I want them to feel contained, but still um, a part of everything that's going on most of the time. Some dogs, you know, like feeling secluded, and you can always throw a blanket over it. Then there are crates that are, um, I don't know what the term is, like the with the plastic sides and they're often called plastic carriers plastic carriers often used for transport actually less less for home use it's like what i used to have for my cat like a cat carrier Mm -hmm. but yeah a lot of people do use them for home use and those can't those are very hard to collapse and hard to clean and um i don't i don't have lots of great feelings about those although maybe if you're transporting a a dog that's the better way to go and then there's the fabric Mm -hmm. ones which um also i think are hard to clean and, and sort of make the dog feel like they're separated from everything else. But, but um, yeah, I, I think what's, what's, what's cool about yours is that it's not like the biggest eyesore <laughs> to have in your home. Sure. And look, I mean, just going into the whole kind of debate between open and airy versus kind of closed. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, so going and, and the whole need for crates in the first place, dens 
come from wolves originally, and, and wolves are den animals. So dogs naturally feel more comfortable in smaller, darker, confined spaces, mm-hmm. um, which is you know one of the reasons that when crate trains, dogs tend to love their crate. They feel mm-hmm. safer yeah. and calmer. And, and, but you and can always throw a blanket over it or put it in the closet, mm-hmm. but you can't you know, take the plastic off of one of those plastic carriers. Exactly. Right? So there's two reasons to go open and airy first. Mm-hmm. One is exactly what you said, right? You can't make something that's already closed unclosed, mm-hmm. right? But you can do the opposite, right? So we're actually developing a crate cover in case you do want to make it corn closed. Oh, cool. But the uh, the other reason is dogs, particularly in warmer climates, can overheat in those mm. other ones. And that's a huge problem for dogs. They don't have as, as efficient a cooling system as we do. Right. And so it's really important for airflow and for uh, and and for comfort that dogs have, especially ones that have like thick coats or whatever, um, to have that air. Uh, if they don't, they can overheat, and, and it's very dangerous for them. And uh, what what about the bed? What what ma- what makes the bed different? Yeah, so our bed is is first of all designed to go in the crate. So in our crate, it's a unique shape. So that, you know that's one piece. But the bigger issue thing is so it's it's fully washable, it's very soft, luxurious. You know, outside waterproof. But the big differentiators were the only pet company that I know of that uses what's called Certipure U.S. Memory Foam. Um, Certipure U.S. Memory Foam is typically found in the most premium of mattresses, usually baby mattresses, uh, because it's certified free for uh, certified free of formaldehydes, heavy metals, uh, ozone depleters, and all kinds of other nasty stuff. Um, and the reason we brought that to the pet industry is that you know if we feel like we want to keep uh, our baby like a, a, around a more pure, higher quality product, why well, wouldn't we want the same for our pet, right? There's no such thing as a truly pre- true proof bed. Like some dogs will get through if they really want to chew on a bed and they get through to the foam. So we took the we have the opinion that if that's the case, then at least let's make the product as benign as possible because traditional foams are as edible as possible. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't want to say edible, but at right. least you're not going to be exposing your your dog to like mercury and mm-hmm. lead, which is like what you find in the cheap foams that are usually used in dog mattresses. Because again, going back to what I said earlier, the pet industry is historically all about low cost, and so. We know that even in human foam, like uh, that is not certified, we find those things. So, and that we get the cheapest stuff that goes in the dog beds. So we've tried to elevate that. Gosh, it's, it, I mean, I've I've talked about this before on the podcast, but it's such a pet peeve of mine when you read articles about things people do for their dogs, and the first paragraph is always like, you know, Betsy slept on a mattress made out of X fancy material, and then went to the hairdresser. Betsy is a dog. You know? <laughs> Like, I feel like there's this attitude of, um, gosh, I was just reading an article like this the other day. Oh, it was, it was an article in the New York Times about people getting, bringing their dogs on hikes or not bringing their dogs, paying like companies that will take your Mm -hmm. dog hiking, um, which actually seemed relatively reasonably priced to me when I thought about like everything that's involved to take someone else's dog hiking, the liability, the transport, et cetera. But it was talking about how it's, it's dog walking on steroids, right? Right, but that the the tone of the story was how you know clearly this is spoiling dogs as if it's like it's more than they deserve. But it's like who sets the line up? Like what? Like what an animal sh- deserves? You know the beautiful. And, oh, right, sorry, no, go ahead. you go ahead. It's it's just like a general. I don't know. It's like a pet peeve of mine to to the this notion that spending money on dogs or giving giving nice things to dogs is indulgent and ridiculous because it's like think about the money people spend on their cars or on their kitchens or on tons of things that benefit no one except for themselves and it's like yeah maybe your dog doesn't need this but your dog also doesn't you know i don't know it's not subsist it's not we're not we don't bring animals into our lives to for like subsistence living for them right like yeah most dogs are no longer working dogs right they're right. not you know the thing about dogs, which is what, and, and pets in general, mm-hmm. but, you know, we're talking about dogs here, um, is that it's really one of the few things in life that is all about pure joy, mm-hmm. right? You don't get a dog for, m- m- like, with the exception of a few working dogs or, you know, seeing eye dogs or those kinds of things, 99% of people get dogs just for the pure joy and companionship. Mm-hmm. And if you get joy out of spoiling your dog, then have at it. Right, right? yeah. <laughs> that, I, I'm tot- I totally feel the same way. If, like, if, if that helps you feel love and feel good and you're benefiting, if your dog benefits from this, then like, you know, your car, your car is not benefiting from the love that you give your car. No, and from a truly kind of like altruistic standpoint, I mean, and you're better off spoiling a dog than a car. Right, right? exactly. And, <laughs> and, and I mean, and to me, that's so much of what good dog training is about. It's about developing a a way to live with your dog that's going to make both of you feel good. I mean, nobody gets a dog and then hopes that they're going to be 
you know, running around after the dog yelling no. (laughs) Well, you bring up a good point. I mean, the only caveat to what we're talking about is I think making so so dogs are are basically put in a place where they are taken out of the dog world and forced to live in the human world, and they've been doing that for thousands of years, and and it's you know they're they're design. I sounds terrible, but. They're bred for that, right? They're, that they're comfortable in that. Yeah. However, they have to learn to live in a human world. And dogs that are not either trained or, or put in position, uh, given the, you know, the guidance they need, right, whether it's structure, whether it's um, understanding what's their space, not their space, mm-hmm. those kinds of things, which feels a little bit like reprimanding to some new dog, you know, uh, new pet parents and stuff like that, is actually making the dog happier because they're learning. Right what the boundaries are and what you know makes the their the the pet parent happy and it also makes them feel like they're doing the right thing and so it brings their energy yeah. down and, and, so that, and a crate too. a crate is a big part of that i mm-hmm. think you know i yeah i think a lot of people misunderstand positive reinforcement as about being like permissive of everything and you know ignore ignoring bad things and praising good things where to me that's not what it's about at all it's about creating structure where you're not going to get the bad stuff you're not going to get behaviors you don't like to begin with because, you know, we control so much about our dog's lives that it's possible to physically control their space and, and time and energy in such a way that that you're you're only going to get behaviors you like, which you then can positively reinforce, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a crate is a big part of that because, yeah, like we can physically control where they're spending their time. And, and if you know where your spe- dog is spending their time, you can you know, have have a better idea of what they're doing and and uh, give them good stuff in the crate. Yeah, and the dog just learns to say, okay, this is my space. Mm-hmm. This is the you know what I'm allowed to do, not allowed to do, and that actually makes them feel calmer. Uh, so, so I like to make the di- distinction between training and 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 uh, management. Obedient. Or, or, yeah, or yeah, training and obedience yeah. versus kind of mindset <laughs> and, and energy, right? If you want your dog to sit or roll over or jump up or mm-hmm. not jump up, that's training. You're just get, getting to, to react to kind of our commands. Okay. Versus if you teach your dog how to feel calm and um, and comfortable in an environment or have tricks to show that you're you, you're in charge, that they don't have to worry about being in charge or things like that, that brings their their energy down and they're, they're more comfortable and they're happier dogs. So I, see, I would say that's the divide between operant conditioning and classical conditioning. Operant conditioning being like you want your dog to to do X, Y, or Z when you say X, Y, or Z. Um, it's about you know how they how they behave and and uh, it's it's the consequences that are are of uh, consequence. <laughs> Whereas learning by association, aka classical conditioning, that's all about helping your dog feel comfortable, feel like I don't have to worry, feel, you know, not, not fearful, um, and, uh, have, have a good experience just existing, you Mm -hmm. know, um, which is, uh, doesn't necessarily have to do with them following your commands or anything like that. It's just a a way of them feeling good about the world around them. But my, my husband, uh, jokes that when he, uh, when he met me, he learned the difference between, a trained dog and an obedient dog because he <laughs> says our dog is well trained but he doesn't necessarily he's not necessarily obedient in that like he doesn't necessarily obey every single thing i say all the time but you know in a larger picture it's he well trained yeah he's very well trained but he can also you know make choices for for himself um what are some of the challenges of actually developing a, a product like this it seems like i wouldn't know where to begin you 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 do have a background then in, in engineering, is that right? Yeah, I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering. Like uh, where did, where did you start? Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of it. You know, one thing uh, I'll say is that I didn't realize how hard it was to bring a physical product to market that mm-hmm. actually works. Uh, so that's why it took two years. Mm-hmm. And, but um, I mean, look, we had to first figure out. Okay, we knew we had this idea that crates kind of are awful. Spoke to some people. Everyone kind of agrees. There's not everything on the market's the same, so what are we missing here, mm-hmm. right? Like you, the question you asked earlier was why has no one done something different in here in this space or materially different anyway? Mm-hmm. And we had to figure that out, um, and so we had to do a whole lot of customer research. So that's where we started. We started doing surveys and you know talking to people at the parks and doing in-home interviews, like ethnographic style interviews, where we went mm-hmm. to people's home and just said like, why is your crate like this, or how do you use it, or why is that thing on top of it? Just just to kind of get a feel for how people actually use it, what the issues are. Uh, and then that 
research took a good few months and then we kind of start to develop like, okay, here's what we really want to solve. Here are the pain points, here are the, the, the design criteria. Uh, and then we had to go find what's called an industrial designer, um, which basically is someone who's like an artist, but for product design. Um, and so they conceive of like, how do, how do the human and the pet interact with the product? And how does that address those design points I was making? So we found, we, we did a big search around the country. We ended up finding a great partner in Boston called Eleven that helped us with the design. From there, once you kind of get these concepts, like these, these almost like artistic concepts, you then go into true engineering where you need engineering help to kind of make the mechanisms work and choose the materials and all that stuff. Uh, and then from there, you have to find manufacturers. And then, you know, we had, that was a big process. We, you know, we tried to get manufactured in the U.S. We couldn't. We tried to get manufactured in Canada. We couldn't. We tried Mexico. We couldn't. Ended up going to China where we found, luckily, phenomenal manufacturers. I mentioned earlier that uh, a premium baby products manufacturer out there. Um, and, uh, you know, once you get that set up, then you've got to prototype and prototype, prototype, prototype. And then eventually, you know, two years later, you have product. <laughs> and uh, you, w at what point did you do your Kickstarter then? We did our Kickstarter in April 2018. So that was when we actually were ready to go to manufacturing. We'd done everything. All we needed to do was get the, a little bit more money and make sure we kind of pr proved everything out. But we had done you know, a year and a half of research, design, development. The supply chain was ready to go. The brand was ready to go. We just needed to make sure that, one, the market existed for it, and, two, that we could raise a bit more money to, you know, get get us through the production process. So it was part of the Kickstarter to sort of make sure that there was enough interest out there? Mm -hmm. I guess I guess the answer was yes, because you exceeded your goal by a lot, right? We did, yeah. We don't, we uh, we set out to raise 30000 We raised 86000 um, but what's cool about that is, you know, when crate sizes, you know, as you, everyone knows, there's multiple, there's different size dogs and most crate companies would have anywhere from four to six sizes typically. Mm -hmm. Um, we only had the small size and just with that one size alone, we did, you know, a really big campaign. So we, you know, that told us that was, okay, there's, there's demand for this and we can not only do it for this product, this size, but we can scale it to different sizes as well. Um, cause we'd learned a lot from just customers reaching out to us every day and we get that still every day. You know, one of the larger sizes coming, one of the larger sizes coming. So when are the larger sizes coming? <laughs> yeah, we're excited. The medium size for dogs up to 50. So the small size is for dogs up to 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. the, the medium size for dogs up to 50 pounds uh, is scheduled for product in market June, July. Uh, we're going to be starting pre-orders, though, end of this month or early March. And what's the what are the the retail costs of, of the different crates? The different sizes? Mm -hmm. uh, so the small size is $224.99. Mm -hmm. Uh, the medium, we haven't set a final price, but it'll be in the low 300s probably. Mm -hmm. uh, the large, uh, we don't have a price for that yet. That's going to depend on the, kind of like a final costing, and that just takes time to get to. And are you finding people are willing to spend that much on a crate? Yeah. Um, what's interesting was, you know, we... Look, the, the, the key thing to remember is that crate is one cost among many about having a, a pet, right? Mm -hmm. And the kind of customer we're going after, that we're targeting, are the customers who you described earlier who just want, really want to spoil their pet and care a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you think about going to a vet visit, one vet visit, right? And, Gosh, and, yeah. and the first year, you have, what, five, five mm -hmm. visits typically, something like that? A vet visit is $150, right? Right. Um, or if, you buy, if you're, again, our customer, you're buying a premium dog food, right? And one 24-pound bag of premium dog food, never mind even like the newer human grade stuff, but like even just traditional kibbles, like $80 a bag right. that lasts six weeks. So in the scheme of things. It's, it's not that much. Right. Well, and I I, I, <laughs> I tell my clients, you know, if you're going to invest in things that are expensive for your dog, you're better off investing in like, if you have a small dog, like a good bag, mm -hmm. you know, I would say like a good crate or something like that, you know, as opposed you have to the, like, an life of the dog. As, as opposed to like an expensive leash or an expensive sweater. You know what I mean? Like those things, you know, sure, if you feel like spending money, if you feel like spending $200 on a sweater, go for it. But, but, uh, you this know, this is like one of those products you need as, as a, for most pet owners, right? And, right. And it's, uh, it's a one time cost. It is. And it's, mm -hmm. and look, like anything, right? There's, there's a reason there's, you know, Toyotas and there's Lexus, there's <laughs> Ford and there's Mercedes, mm -hmm. you know, there's just different markets. And mm -hmm. we're not saying it's our products for everybody. There's, but, all that exists today is the cheap wire crate. Mm -hmm. right? That's really all that exists. So, are there other companies that are that are doing innovative crates that you look at? Absolutely. Think, uh, interesting. So mm -hmm. I think one company that I find really interesting is a company called Gunner Kennels. Um, they're even more expensive. They their small is three fifty, but they're targeting a different kind of consumer. So we're targeting. And what uh, what's interesting about their their crate? 
Uh, it's you know really indestructible, um, and they've created just a nice brand. There's a nice story around like the testing they've done around it, and uh, you know the use case, which they're targeting hunters and outdoors people. Mm -hmm. uh, so think like throwing a, a crate on the back of your pickup truck and going hunting, and you you know that uh, you, you feel like confident that your dog is safe and the dog is never getting out no matter what. Right. That's their that's who they're targeting. Yours is more for the like uh, New York City studio apartment Maltese. <laughs> exactly. You know, we're targeting, you know, uh, folks in bigger cities or really people who are, you know, your average dog owner, but but care ab about their dog in a different way. Mm -hmm. Right. And care to have something like you were talking about. A lot of folks that you speak to about crates don't want crates because it's ugly in mm -hmm. where they are. Right. Mm -hmm. We want we're ta we're targeting those. Funny enough, that's who we designed this crate for. And that's certainly who the majority of our customers are. But we're also getting a really warm reception from folks in the show dog and do and kind of trick mm. dog, you know, the mm -hmm. um, the agility dogs. Mm -hmm. Reason being that they, they have by rules, they have to use crates in all their competitions and everywhere they go. So they're constantly lugging around these awful crates and they're heavy and they're hard to move around. And so uh, they're very hard to collapse. So they've been really excited about our collapse of, like collapsing function. So oh, I bet. Yeah. I didn't even think of that, but we've had this whole success. Like we actually had a booth at the American Kennel Club National Championship in Orlando in December huh. and reception was phenomenal. So we're really excited about those customers as well. Are there well. any Westminster dogs that are going to be using your, your grades? Do you know? Uh, we, it's funny. Uh, uh, we were thinking about, we, we were talking about partnering with um, uh, one of the top Pomeranians. Um, and we tried to get a booth at Westminster, but there's a multi-year waiting list we found out. So <laughs> hopefully next year. <laughs> um, wasn't there another crate company on Kickstarter right around when you guys had your Kickstarter? Am I am I misremembering this? No, it's a very good memory. Yeah, there was a company I don't, called... I don't remember what it was um, called. It was, it was called Chasing Monkey at the time. I believe they changed their name and their product was called P-A-W-D. I'm not sure if they called Pod or Paw, Pawdy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they, they were, what's interesting was they had identified a lot of the same problems that we had in, in terms of like, you know, all the, the pain points of regular crates. They took a different approach though. Um, their product is, um, really geared towards toy breeds from what I can tell. And mm -hmm. it's, um, geared towards, uh, like it's, it's just panels of plastic for assembly. I've never used it. Uh, panels of plastic. Yeah. Then? So think of it like you, you like a, a plastic carrier that you assemble. Okay. So rather than collapsing, it like pieces together. Correct. Uh, it doesn't look like, again. I I don't want to speak negatively because I've never used it, seen it, touched mm -hmm. it, whatever. It just strikes me as more of um, it, it's not very structural, right? So it's not meant for most do you know dogs that do need containment. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I've never seen it. So I know I know your goal is to develop more products. Is is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a a, a a window into what the future holds? Sure. So when we, you know, I'll give you sort of the context first mm -hmm. and then I'll get into the future yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, when we started to look at the dog crate, which was the original idea um, because I tried to get a dog crate for my most recent dog and couldn't stand it and whatever, we actually realized that the same problem we see in dog crates is actually true of many pet supplies like gates and stroller, pet strollers and bowls. They're all very similar and haven't innovated in a very long time. Mm -hmm. So what we realize is what will be really exciting for us is to create an innovative brand in pet supplies where, where what we're trying to do every time is bring something new and fresh to the table. Like we won't release something unless it's, it's somehow game changing or somehow different. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're going to be focused on certainly bigger sizes for the crate. Uh, that's obvious. Uh, a lot of accessories for the crate that we want to build out. So we're, this year we're going to do a bowl. We're going to have a, a, a crate cover. And I can't give the details yet, but I can tell you both those things are, are pretty unique and, and innovative in what we're, we're bringing there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have like a – we get a lot of requests for like a, a, just a, a case to, to travel with so you can bring your crate with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also going to do eventually some really cool like maybe tech products like a camera in the crate. So when you're leaving your dog at home, you can, you can watch your dog in the crate. Um, we're also doing a toy line. We're also, uh, you know, early stages of a stroller and all kinds of cool products where we're really trying to change the game a little bit. Um, what I'm struck by in the in the pet product world is what seems to me like an overabundance of of products that are uh, offer unnecessary amounts of tracking. I guess is is I, like. When when I uh, I met you a few months ago at this um, uh, product showcase, I guess it was like a digital pro pet 
digital pet product showcase that, that was held that I that I stopped by and uh, and I think that's when I first saw your crates. But I was kind of impressed by your your crates and your company in that you were the you seemed like the only business there that wasn't offering something that was needlessly Bluetooth enabled. <laughs> like <laughs> everything there was like a bed that weighed your dog and alerted you if your dog gained or lost weight or or a, or a food bowl that that measured exactly what your dog ate or or god i don't even remember you know the various kinds of uh, uh treat dispensers food dispensers uh, vacuums that you know, i don't know talk to your dog <laughs> but um uh, balls that you know calculated how many times your dog caught it, or and it, it just it seemed like nuttiness to me, like uh, like how how much how much do we really need to be moder- monitoring all of these things? Like if my dog gains weight, I think I can just tell rather than having a bed that's measuring it. So people are obsessed with with tracking their own, you know, their sleep, their food, their their weight and whatever. And like, do we, is there a real reason to be extending this to dogs or is it just like a lack of creativity of trying to figure out new ways to innovate old products other than adding this wireless capability to it? What's, what's your take on yeah, this, the, this direction. I hope you're not going to be like, well, that's our plan too. <laughs> no, we're <yeah. laughs> I'll be like, screw you, Annie. <laughs> but look, I mean, there's no question we're in an age where uh, digitization of everything around us is happening. Yeah, and it's going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, we, and I think there are instances where it's useful and cool. But... Sure. And I mentioned the camera for the crate because mm-hmm. if you look at it, like people actually do use safety cameras and sure. baby monitors yeah. and all that no kind of stuff. No problem with that. <laughs> Uh, I think what you're referring to, though, is the people who are or the companies that are coming out that are just like seem to be putting on some sort of accelerometer or some sort of Bluetooth, like you said, just for the sake of it. And I think there is a feeling that if you bring anything like that to market that, you know, people are just going to kind of get excited about, oh, it's cool, it's new, mm-hmm, it's innovative. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be some stuff that hit. But I think for every kind of thing, you know, product like the the Whistle GPS collar that did really well and was bought by Mars, there's going to be, you know, nine failures just because they're just they're not truly valuable, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think our perspective is you have to start with the problem. What is it you're actually trying to solve mm-hmm. for the customer? And if you, st- if you start with something, if you start with the premise like, oh, this is cool versus, oh, I'm solving a problem, I think you're going to run into this whole, I'm going to make this thing because it's cool and maybe someone will buy it. Mm-hmm. But most people won't mm-hmm. because it's not really addressing any issue. And then if you go through to I'm solving a problem, you're saying... You know, talk, you're talking about overweight dogs. Well, I want to know if my dog is overweight. Is that a truly a problem? I guess the researcher have to say I'm not an expert in that. But um, let's say for argument's sake it is a problem they need to solve. Then the next question is, is data, technology, et cetera, the best way to solve that when you think about cost, complexity, et cetera? Or is there a simpler, better, faster solution that would actually address the problem you're trying to solve? Mm-hmm. And so... I think that technology plays a very good role in solving those problems when it's applied and used in, in you know, a very thoughtful manner. It's funny. We, so I'm going to give you my, my two product ideas, and you can, you can run with them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you credit. Um, one, one is um, a, a vibrating collar. A collar that, like, you can um, press a button and the the collar just vibrates. It doesn't have, like, any kind of uh, shock component because there are shock collars that have a vibrating function, but I haven't found one that just has vibrating and and doesn't offer shock as an option because um, a a, a little vibration, nothing that would hurt a dog at all, but just, like, a small vibration um, could be used as like a marker in the same way that we use a clicker mm-hmm. uh, to like pinpoint when a dog does something you want the dog to do. And I think that could be useful for a lot of dogs, but p- specifically for deaf dogs. Um, mm. uh, I think it could also be a really great way to teach a, a recall, um, to teach the dog, oh, when I feel this vibration, I have to, you know, go back to go back to my human. So that's one. <laughs> the other is a, is a product that I have seen a lot of, a lot of, uh, companies try to do something with which is um, a really good treat dispenser we use at school for the dogs this um this 
uh, treat dispenser made by PetSafe that's been on the mm-hmm. market for a long time called the Treat and Train. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Are you mm-hmm. familiar with the Treat and Train? No, you're not the brand name, mm-hmm. but I've, I, I know PetSafe well and I've seen their treat dispensers, but I'm yeah. not sure what brand uh, that one is. They, it's, um, it operates on a, on a radio waves. It has like three or four channels that you can use and it's uh, really sturdy, really dependable. Um, you can use a lot of different kinds of hard hard treats in it. Um, I, I think it's a really great product, but it's not it's not Bluetooth enabled. It's not wireless enabled. It doesn't have a camera on it, which I think is it's kind of fine. Like it, it, for what it is, it's excellent. But um, I've and I but I've seen so many other uh, companies in the last four or five years come out with treat dispensers that have all kinds of bells and whistles and just mm-hmm. don't work as well as this sort of like basic basic device um including we had one that um I, that we got to try at the studio i think it's called the pet z actually that was also at that um at that uh pet product uh digital it's a pet big product. new category there's, yeah. there's furbo and there's right and i've, I've tried a lot of them uh-huh. and they eat each of them has a problem like there there's one i think maybe it's the I, ibo or furbo that like can only hold like 12 treats or something so mm-hmm. then like you're done or or the the pet z was the one though that <laughs> was kind of it was it was a problem in kind of a hilarious way where it worked pretty well but rather than just like dispensing one treat which is what's so nice about the treat and train or like two treats or like a couple little pieces of kibble <laughs> it like shot out like 15 pieces like bullets wow. and so the dogs would just totally freak out <laughs> every time the thing went off and uh, i remember they when they when we got it it, it was it came I, th- I think we got like a free one to test, and they sent it to us a, a bunch, a, along with a whole bunch of uh, milk bones, which all of us trainers opening it up thought was funny. And it's not because like a milk bone is like a bad thing; like it's not, it's not like the quality of the milk bone that's the problem. It's just trainers like to give really small treats, and you can't break up a milk bone. So we were like, oh, this certainly wasn't developed by <laughs> by a trainer. A trainer wouldn't have, you know, suggested using a milk bone in training. Um, anyway, so I, I, I wish there was a product that was like the treat and train that like, just like would dispense one or two treats at a time that you could use like from your phone, um, maybe that had a camera so you could, you know, do it while you were at work. I think that would be a cool feature, but, but something that that's that dependable where it seems like all those, like you said, it's a big category, but most of the, most of that category looks like it's about, People who want to like see what their dog is doing and give it a treat as kind of like a, a novelty, you know. Like, so like that's a secondary function versus like right. you're talking about like the treat dispensing a primary function. Like you, could, I think you could actually like I could use a treat and train with a, a camera from the hallway and train and actually train a dog to do something like without being in the room if I could see what the dog was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I could train the dog to go to its bed. I could train the dog to sit. Um, uh, but. Yeah, the, that's not the primary purpose of any of the dispensers that are out there. Um, like, there's another one that um, that I saw that dispenses, like, a huge cookie. Like, well, what's the use of that if you're actually trying to train? You know, I, right. get, I get it as sort of a cute thing. Like, look, I gave my dog a cookie. Or that there's ones where your dog can see your face on, like, a camera. Like, I don't think your dog cares at all about seeing your face when you're not there. <laughs> Or there's one, there's one that like sprays a scent. Even it's like it's like they've thought of every different way of of, of yeah of making this device except except they haven't made one that's like what I want. <laughs> you know what's interesting about product development is number one, you can't satisfy everybody. You True. know that's the biggest thing you learn is you you want to you want to make this perfect. But like who's for, being satisfied by the thing that sprays out a scent? You know, it's like it's like somebody came, it's like you're saying sure. someone came up with an idea of like this is a cool thing we could do. Dogs have good noses, but I don't know who actually is like. Oh, I'm so glad they they found a thing that I can be at work and spray a scent for my dog when I'm not there. You know. Yeah, I, <laughs> I can't. I don't know that you know that market nor that product well at all. But I can say that you know. When I, jo- I make this joke about dog crates, right? The mm-hmm. perfect dog crate would cost nothing, weigh nothing, be infinitely strong, and fold up into your pocket. Okay. Right? <laughs> but none of the all those things are like diametrically opposed, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And so every time you want to make something lighter, let's say, for example, that adds cost. Mm-hmm. Or every, you want to make something stronger, that adds weight, mm-hmm. you know? And so you try and find the right balance of like what you think the the average customer is looking for and give them that. That's the first thing. And the second thing is... 
you also want to make sure that you 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 have a built into your pipeline of how to iterate on the product, right? Because mm-hmm. version one is never perfect. Uh, mm-hmm. It's as good as you can, and you, 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 you but you don't know how people are going to use it or what people are going to like or dislike. And so it's very important that you build into your product development how to iterate and mm-hmm. how to make it better and like listen to your customer and what are they saying, what do they like, not like, how do you make it, you know, improve it over time. The product that you like with the treat dispenser from PetSafe, they have the benefit of being around for a really long time. So I mm-hmm. bet you their version, who knows what, because they've listened to the customer, they've heard the things you're talking about and they've like iterated. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, I think the ones that are going to be successful in the new kinds, the furbos of the world are the ones that are listening to the customer and listening to feedback like yours and iterating quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, except I think most people don't think about dog training, right? Most people aren't designing for the dog trainer. Maybe not. But, um, you know, I hope I hope to change that. Well, you know, I see dog training as something that's happening all the time, something right. that affects anyone who has a dog yep. and something that is doesn't have to be like, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a job. It doesn't have to be a chore. It should be a fun, a fun thing. And anyone who has a dog is training their dog. But mm-hmm. I know that I'm, I'm in the minority of people. <laughs> Most people don't give dog training a second thought. Well, it's been so good to talk to you. Is there anything we haven't touched on that that you want to mention? No, it's been a fun mm-hmm. conversation. Where, where can people find the Revel? Uh, on our website, uh, digs.pet, D-I-G-G-S dot P-E-T. Uh, you can also find it in a few stores now um, in uh, the New York area in in uh, Pet Pantry Warehouse. Uh, right now, we have, we're at a pop-up. Where, where's Pet Pantry Warehouse? Uh, we're in a few locations. Ryan, New York, uh, Riverside, uh, Riverside, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we're now in a third uh, in, a, in a pop-up store called Batch in San Francisco, and we'll be launching. Is uh, that is that like a pet? A pet place, or they have a it's a pet exhibit right now of various brands, um, uh, and it's it's right in uh, Russian Hill, so it's a really cool area, uh, and you can go check out like we've got a display there, and uh, you can learn about the product from there from the staff there, uh, and we're also at uh, we're going to be launching at Healthy Spot in uh, a couple locations in Southern California um, in mid February, so you can go check that out there as well. But right now we're available on our website digs.pet. Okay. Um, I look forward to your, your next products. Yeah, look forward to it as well and talking to you further. All right. Thank you so much, Sal. Sure. Thanks. Our woof shout out this week goes to my good dog friend, Gilby, the French bulldog. Um, I think I've mentioned him on this podcast before. He can be found on uh, Instagram at Gilby Chris. His human is our, uh, podcast producer Alex Chris and her husband Benny and uh, Gilby has the best go to crate that I've ever seen he <laughs> he when he's timed for him to go to his crate he zooms into it so quickly it's really something to be seen you wouldn't think a little French bulldog could move so quickly I'll put up a video this week of it on Instagram, and if you have uh, a good video of your dog going into his crate with a lot of speed, share it with me. Um, Just uh, go ahead and tag at School for the Dogs on Instagram. And our fun dog fact of the day, so, you know, the State of the Union was the other day, and uh, it just got me thinking about how uh, President Trump is always uh, referring to people as dogs in a derogatory way. So he's always calling people dogs. It got me wondering how many people actually call their dog by his name. And uh, my attempt to research this led me to New York City's database of registered dogs, which was most recently updated in September 2017. And uh, according to this database, which I will link to in the show notes, there is only one dog named Trump in New York City. He is a Papillon who lives in the Bronx, but there are seven dogs named Donald throughout the five boroughs, and there is one dog, a Yorkie, who lives in the Midwood section of Brooklyn named Ivanka. All of these dogs seem to have been born uh, before the 2016 election, And I should mention that it looks like there are no dogs in New York City named Eric. If you're interested in checking out the Revel Crate, we are going to have one in our shop 
at uh, School for the Dogs, which is at 92 East 7th Street near 1st Avenue. You can also find it at storeforthedogs.com. Uh, you can get there directly if you go to schoolforthedogs.com slash revel, that's R-E-V-O-L. And uh, through the end of March, get $25 off the Revel Crate when you use code SFTD25 at checkout at storeforthedogs.com. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by telling your friends about it, leaving a review, or shopping in our online store. You can learn more about us and sign up to get lots of free training resources when you visit us online at schoolforthedogs.com. 